I would like to introduce Adrian Ruder Cortez. He's a wildlife biologist, a falconer with over four decades of experience flying birds, the current IAF uh, Vice President for Latin America and Caribbean, and he is a special he specializes in wildlife trade and trafficking issues mostly in Latin America and the Caribbean. Please welcome Adrian. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's a privilege and uh, also a lot of pressure after the previous presenters, which have lots of experience from uh, all of from whom I've learned a lot over the years. So uh, it's a bit overwhelming <laughs> to be here uh, after listening to them. So I'm going to I want to share you uh, share with you a little bit of what's going on in Latin America. Uh, more or less the challenges, opportunities, and the road ahead that we have in development of falconry in Latin America. Uh, interestingly, just about a month ago, this uh, scientific article was published by a colleague, a contributor to the IAF, Salvador Garcilita, on uh, falconry Latin America. And he actually did a survey uh, with different Latin American uh, people and falconers uh, he got roughly 60-something responses from all over the region, from different countries, just to have a glimpse of what is taking place, what is the average age of falconers, what birds are being flown, and also asking a few interesting questions. For example, can you describe what falconry means to you in one single word? And what you see, uh, upper right, is was uh, the the result and the size of the word is the more results the bigger the word so for me that was really interesting and i really liked it because it's passion life art style symbolism connection freedom hunting uh, passionating no? so yeah, and actually i think that's a very good description of what we all feel whether we are in latin america in africa in asia in north america uh, or the caribbean and also uh, interesting in, in this article is kind of the average age of falconers between the 20s and 35 years old, roughly. And also how much time uh, current falconers, or at least those surveyed, have been into falconry, have been practicing falconry. So you can see that uh, graph in the right that shows that uh, most, of, most of them are between uh, one and ten years into falconry and some uh, far more years, which also shows a little bit of the age, uh, which is not that good. But uh, there is some history of falconry in Latin America, even though many of us might not be aware of that. Uh, I there are some indications that falconry was practiced by Spaniards after the colonial times, so in the 1600s or so, but then there's a, a big lack of information. And the falconry, as we know, it actually developed quite rapidly over the past 40 and 50 years in different uh, countries of Latin America. So uh, some of the contributors, part of the Latin America Working Group of the IAF, uh, from the different countries, they developed like, some summaries of what they uh, knew about falconry in their own countries, with the, the ones that you can see in the pictures here, uh, from Colombia, Mexico, Ecuador, Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, Chile, Panama, Peru, Venezuela, El Salvador. So all of these countries have different histories of how it has developed. Some of them, they started in the 70s, in the 80s with a, a couple of people or maybe just one interested people. And some have just started maybe 10 years ago, uh, 5 years ago. 15 years ago, and they're fairly new to the activity. But uh, the fact is that there's an interest uh, in falconry. There are very passionate people who love this activity, and uh, the circumstances are a bit different to what you have seen in Europe or in, the, in North America, which uh, causes certain challenges. So as a megadiverse region, Latin America, has a wide variety of environments which also allow for the existence of a wide variety of raptors. So we have uh, all those species that were, are very well known to everybody that have been widely used and are now used all over the world, such as the Harris hawk, uh, Rattle hawk, you know, the peregrine falcon, uh, Kestrel, Cooper's hawk, and uh, right now 
more and more often the Aplomado falcon. So these species are fairly familiar to us, but uh, it is very interesting that currently there are other species being used or uh, the, their use in falconry being explored by Latin American falconers. Species such as the bicolor, bicolor hawk, the bat falcon, the little gray falcon, Alconcito gris, upper right, um, and uh, the different hawk eagles, such as the ornate hawk eagles or the black hawk eagle, and even the collar forest falcon, Micrastor semeteorquatus. These have been flown by different individuals in different countries. Uh, I recall uh, Raul Palacios in Paraguay flying bat falcons successfully, and also the Micrastor semitorquatus and ornate hawk eagles. He's a, a good falconer there. And many friends in Peru uh, or Argentina flying bicolor hawks very, very successfully. So this is al also open windows of opportunity for other species that had not been previously known to falconry, but that have a huge potential and could be used. Over the past 20 years, there has also been an increase in imports of raptors for falconry purposes in Latin America. Uh, you can see a uh, perlin in the left, barbary falcon, a uh, peregrine kestrel hybrid, then uh, in, in the bed of fe feathers, and even a red-necked falcon, uh, just as, as a few examples. But once you get like hybrid saker falcons, uh, saker peregrine hybrids, uh, jeer peregrine hybrids, etc., in some places, with the difficulties involved. Uh, health regulations are very strict in many of the countries, and uh, birds are usually far too expensive for the average falconer to acquire, and there are lots and lots of permits to go through. So it's only a uh, very few people that can afford uh, and go through all the hassle in order to obtain a bird from abroad. But uh, also over the past few years, there has been an interest in the captive breeding of different birds. So now you have more and more breeders, particularly in Mexico, in Peru, in Argentina, uh, that are very successful and breeding uh, peregrine falcons, aplomado falcons, Harris hawks, the little uh, gray falcon that I showed before in Argentina. And uh, there is not such a high variety of species available from captive breeding facilities right now, but that is increasing and the experience is also increasing. Uh, we are still way behind other countries on this, but uh, we're getting there. There are also many clubs and associations that have appeared, disappeared, or continue with varied degrees of success in the different countries. And uh, from now on, I'm pr pr probably just going to show pictures, just so not as to make it so boring for you. Might not be related to the text, but uh, just to show you more or less what uh, takes place mostly in Mexico, where I come from, and these are some of the outings that that uh, I do. But uh, yeah, there are lots of people who are interested in into falconry. There are not that many people committed to taking action, uh, investing time or effort to support. Uh, associations or groups or get, in, get into legal quarries with authorities, etc. So that's one of the big challenges that uh, we all face. Uh, people prefer to be in the field flying hawks than sitting in meeting rooms or developing documents to discuss issues with governments. And that's understandable, but uh, there always must be somebody to, uh, to do that if we want to continue with that activity all over the places. Uh, we also face different challenges. Some are information and education related, some are legal and policy related, and some are on the actual practice of the sport. Uh, there is uh, information on falconry right now. There didn't used to be a lot of information in Spanish, Portuguese uh, in past years. That is slowly changing. Now there are a few books that are being published in Spanish. And I think that one of the big reasons why falconry was boosted probably in the 70s in Latin America was because of Felix Rodriguez de la Fuente's book, The Art of Falconry, uh, that was in Spanish. And uh, at the time, I, I started falconry when I was 11. And uh, at the time, there were only a handful of, of falconers or wannabe falconers in Mexico. And the one who had photocopies of Felix's book was like God. I mean, then they, they wouldn't even talk to you, no? Because they had all the information. They knew everything. They had it all. So uh, just trying to approach them and, hey, would it be possible to get copies of your photocopies? No. <laughs> that was it. 
that was it. It took me probably 10 years to get photocopies of the photocopies. Uh, uh, so <laughs> a few years later, they published in Mexico the same book, a copy of the book uh, of Felix Rodríguez de la Fuente, which was widespread, was affordable, and that opened a window of knowledge to many of us uh, that was of easy access. And I think that changed things in Latin America and that uh, caused that many, many people was, were actually to try pursuing falconry with a little bit of information that was uh, coming from, from an expert. So uh, we are still lacking a lot of information. There is a lot of information out there, and with social media and internet, there's a lot of misinformation uh, out there as well, and tons of uh, internet or social media experts that have never touched the ground, that have never flown birds, and that's very unfortunate because that poses a big, big challenge uh, to those that then get a bird and they do things wrong and the birds are killed, uh, there are welfare issues and of course there are also legal issues and uh, perception issues and profile issues for falconry I I for all of us who wants to do it, to do it right. No? And then all these, uh, this e these extreme green groups, they have tools to act against uh, falconers and falconry. And also we have legal and policy related ch uh, challenges. In, uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, developed regulation in most countries on falconry. So falconry uh, is kind of in the limbo, in a gray zone, in a gray area, in the best case scenario. In a few countries, it is completely forbidden and prohibited. For example, in Colombia or El Salvador, they are not allowed to practice falconry. Uh, so uh, it, is, it is done illegally or uh, they have special permits, those who do uh, bird control at the airport, if you want, and they call it falconry, even though it might not be falconry. Uh, so we have all those uh, limitations, and some countries like Argentina, they are moving forward, they are having great success in legalizing falconry in different provinces, and should be used as examples. Uh, but we still have a very, very, very long way to go, and for the governments, for the authorities, it's usually easier to prohibit something uh, particularly if it's just a handful of people practicing that activity or in the, the countries where more uh, uh, falconers exist, such as Mexico, maybe 500 to 1,000 people in all over the country, still is a small number of people for the hassle that would be developing regulations and going through all the process. So, And th we also have some practical challenges. Uh, most of the falconers live in big cities, so just getting to a proper flying or hunting ground takes hours. In my case, I live in Mexico City, roughly 26 million people living there. So you can imagine there are not a lot of hunting grounds in the city. I have to drive almost an hour and a half, two hours each way to get to a place where I can actually hunt with my Merlin. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's a Merlin. So if you want to, to get all prey, it might be uh, longer than that. No? And that, so that's one of the big challenges. Hunting grounds, quarry, uh, not that much getting the permits from the people. Usually they don't, they don't care if you, if you don't uh, mess with their crops and, and, and so on. But that's also one of the challenges we have. And most of the birds, uh, you, you, you will see me there, or the plumouse and merlins is usually my birds that you see in the pictures. And you can see some of the grounds that I, I, I usually fly or hunt on. Uh, but we also have some good opportunities. Given that many countries in, the, in Latin America are in the early stages of developing these frameworks for the practice of falconry, we can learn a lot from experiences in Europe, in North America, in Africa, uh, where things have gone right and where you have already committed the mistakes and solved them, or uh, have gone over the challenges and been able to find a solution. So I think there are good, great opportunities. Uh, there are more, ava ava more materials available in Spanish, uh, which is helping inform all of those interested and uh, providing guidance. And there are important fora in the countries where uh, you can actually present your case to government authorities, to institutions. And also the openness in many countries for a people to contribute, for example, in rehabilitation efforts or in research-related efforts, which might change the perception of falconers among some key actors, such as the academia or the governments. So I think that's, uh, that's also quite important to mention. Um. 
we also have some uh, great opportunities with uh, falconry organizations, both national and international, that have developed guidelines, position papers, and uh, have a lot of expertise that can support all uh, our countries in Latin America on their national efforts to, to move forward in the right direction. And I think the IIF is a great example of that, uh, not only because it has produced and developed a lot of very useful materials and, uh, and that can be used as arguments when having discussions with the governments, uh, when, when having interviews even on welfare issues uh, or on, on international global topics that are discussed in international forums such as CITES, but uh, also because uh, in organizations such as the IIF, there are many, many experts with lots of experience that are usually willing to support you if you approach them, if you contact them. And the IIF can play a major, and is playing a major role on uh, making things better for falconers or the falconry community around the world. And that's certainly the case also for Latin America. So uh, I think those efforts should be encouraged and, uh, and I particularly am very grateful for all the work that the IIF is doing in Latin America and also uh, promoting uh, good falconry uh, there and representing falconry in international fora that usually we cannot access or we cannot afford to go to such as the convention of migratory species cites uh, and and others now what what uh, is the road ahead what is going to take place we can probably expect for more restrictions to be generated in the near future, and not only in Latin America, but I think globally. Uh, and we have to proactively promote and develop legal frameworks that allow for the practice of the sport. And we have to get engaged, we have to get involved uh, with all decision-making processes. And one of the key things is the pandemic, and I'll go back to that uh, just in a, in a couple of minutes, but uh, we also have to ensure the access to birds for falconry and prey. So we can explore opportunities for wild take where it makes sense and also promote good practices on captive breeding. Um, develop kits of information, arguments and, scientif and, and scientific data to counter arguments by extreme animal welfare groups or wildlife managers or decision makers with an extreme green agenda. There are those, those are things that I, I believe we can do and we can start working on uh, in order to, to face the, some of the challenges that we, we face. But as said, I think that prohibition, prohibitions, limitations are some of the key factors that might be coming in Latin America and uh, as said, because the representation of falconers is not that high as in North America or Europe. and. Uh, and we, I believe that given the, the emerging threats, such as uh, the pandemics caused by zoonotic diseases, which is something that everybody's talking about right now, that was not in the map <laughs> just a few years ago, we have to follow national and international policies and existing relevant fora. Uh, I mentioned CITES, I mentioned Convention of uh, Migratory Species, CMS, the Convention of Biological Diversity, CBD, uh, and the World Health, World Health Organization, or those fora that might be formed in the near future. And this might be new to most of you here, but uh, given that it's part of my day-to-day -day job as uh, a staff of a uh, uh, wildlife conservation society and an NGO, conservation NGO based in New York, it, under the umbrella of the World Health Organization, they are starting a discussion to develop a new international treaty on pandemic preparedness and response. And this is going to be discussed on in the World Health Assembly in Geneva in May 2022. So uh, I, d I think that there are a lot of things that we can do. I think Latin America is in a good spot. We can learn from all the mistakes from the past. We can access the support. We have to be humble enough to accept that we don't know everything. <laughs> We've only been there in uh, probably 40, 50 years in the development of falconry. And, uh, and there are many, many of you uh, here and in other places of the world that can guide us, that can help us, that can support us, and that are willing to do so, which is absolutely a fantastic opportunity. And lastly, and it was mentioned by Tony James, uh, 
I think in a, in a fantastic way, we have to think in the new generations. Uh, they, all that what we do right now is going to be hopefully in benefit of all these new generations who want to practice the sport. Uh, I was lucky, uh, that's me in the upper left, <laughs> uh, more or less when I started, I was 10, 11 years old, and my parents thought that, okay, let him have his bird, it, it's going to die, and then it's going to be over, because I had been bugging them for over a year, and poor them, it never happened. So 44 years after, I'm still flying small falcons, and I'm still absolutely passionate about the sport, and, uh, and in the bottom, you can see that's my kit uh, right now, and a uh, bunch of merlins, and that is why I think it's so important to work towards Faltoni, to uh, accept help and ask for help when needed because they are going to appreciate it in the future if they decide to go into falconry. So I just want to end uh, with this. Uh, muchas gracias por su atención. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to respond. Thank you, Adrian. We have question, or time for one question, and then you can go and grab him after the event. Thank you. I got a question, Andrew, uh, Adrian, to ask you about uh, where you hawk. So you said you have to go out of the city for two hours. Is that like government-owned land? Is it uh, privately-owned land? Did you have to get permission to get on there? Or? There, there are different land tenure schemes in Mexico. Some of them are called ejidos. So the land is owned by a group of, of people from the locality uh, who are allowed to, you know, to have crops and, and so on. It's not owned by the land, uh, but uh, it's owned by them, but kind of a communal land uh, for, for these people. So it, that, that is where we usually go. Uh, what we do is we, we usually go and talk to them. You see them work in the fields and everything. Is it okay for me to fly my birds? And they usually say, oh, it's pretty cool. Like, yeah, sure. Go. Or they just don't care. And yeah, as long as you don't cut my nopales, I'm fine. No? And, right, uh, right. and so we, we have to be very careful with that because then uh, when some uh, ostringers or falconers, they do things wrong, for example, they go and they beat uh, the plants off just to to take a, a rabbit or a, or, or a hare or something with the Harris Hawks, uh, usually, uh, then they close the door to everybody, no? Uh, and it's hard because I, I've been in that situation when they see me with my little Merlin and, and I hunt morning doves, then they are fine with that. They, 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 they couldn't care less because you are very careful on where you step on and everything. But if they see you beating the, the crops and everything, that's, that's it, no? And, and um, that's unfortunate because most of the, uh, of the people, given the scarcity of quarry, they, they don't follow the ethical standards and they just do whatever they need to do to get a, a slip, no? And uh, that's quite unfortunate. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Adrian.